I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. Today I'd like to introduce thermodynamics, specifically biological thermodynamics, and its implications in biology and life sciences. So thermodynamics is generally the study of energy. And we write at its most fundamental level, we split energy up and look at its contributions from various forms. Because we're always in a biological system thinking about a part of the universe, the part we'll call the system, and everything else being the surroundings. And really, uh, most of thermodynamics is about bookkeeping of where various types of energy goes. Now, from introductory physics, one of the first bifurcations we think in energy is what we learned in physics, that you can split up energy into kinetic and potential energy terms. And this is often very useful for problems. In thermodynamics, the useful way of splitting up different types of energy is in different types of work, whether it be some type of mechanical work, some type of chemical work process, some type of electrical work, etc. And then we also have another type of energy, which is typically called heat, for the obvious implications of, of practicality that it comes about most commonly to our senses by a change in temperature or a thermal effect. In fact, this is how thermodynamics got its name in general. Um, so by keeping track of a unique type of energy called heat and then the various types of other energy, which we split up into different types of work, um, is how we're gonna be able to look and frame uh, thermodynamics or basically the theory of the macroscopic for biological systems. And one of the nice things about this is, is that we're gonna find out that the energies that we look at all end up being state functions, which we're gonna define later when we look at the mathematics of thermodynamics. But it has the implication that we really just have to, uh, it, we usually think about just the change in some energy process, not the absolute energy itself, but the change during some process. So almost always, when we talk about energy, we often even leave out that we're saying the change in energy, but really that's almost always what we're looking at is the change in energy. And specifically, we're gonna call it internal energy and use a capital U to define it. And this is just to remind us that we're talking about the internal energy or the energy of a part of the universe that we're gonna call the system, okay? And so that's the biological system that we're interested in this case. So again, almost all biological processes, uh, when we're looking at macroscopically, uh, can be framed in thermodynamics to look at its energy or, or how it changes. And so from things as, as simple as mechanical type work, for example, some force over some uh, derivative and some length property, to changing the concentration of compounds, some chemical work, some nuances into chemical work, like looking at just how you change or move electrons, the, um, the concentration of electrons and how their potential changes, electrical work. Um, we can even interact with light in various forms, whether uh, to change the energy of a system in things like bioluminescence and things in photosynthesis, et cetera. And almost all of these has some process where we're looking at some type of energy that's related to a work type function, chemical or mechanical, et cetera, electrical work, and then also keeping track of the heat associated with it. And so in thermodynamics, it's usually putting everything in terms of these work functions and also heat. And keeping track of that gives us, keeps track of the entire energy of the, um, of the system of interest. And so what I think of as the fundamental equation of thermodynamics, the one that summarizes the laws, is one I keep showing over and over throughout these slides, which is that the change in internal energy, because it's usually the change that we're always measuring, has a heat component, and that, that goes as the temperature times the change in the entropy, and then however many, some of the different works that are involved in the process. In biological systems, this is often something uh, mechanical work, pressure, volume, mechanical work, 
and then chemical work, the change in uh, the number of moles and chemical potential of a system. And usually this encompasses most of what we need for a lot of biological processes. However, when we need other specific work functions, whether it be, say, something that is undergoing a change in its magnetic properties, magnetic moment into a magnetic field, we can always add these extra work terms on. But a lot of biology can be very well looked at by just looking at how biochemistry or chemical work is happening in a system. And that's why I've explicitly shown it here. So really the big distinguishing thing, kind of like we said we distinguish potential and kinetic energy when we look at energy in fundamental physics often, in thermodynamics we split it up into a heat component which always has the same um, variables that define it, temperature and entropy. And then we also, the addition of, of different types of work that are involved in a specific problem, whether it be what I've shown here, the two most common mechanical work uh, in pressure, volume, space, three-dimensional space we're working in, and the change in the chemistry, the biochemistry that's happening through a chemical work term. But everything, as the top equation shows, has this general formula that you have a heat and then it adds this conjugate field of all the different works that are important. And the lower equation shows the two that are most commonly used when we are introducing and working problems in biological thermodynamics. And below shows uh, what we kind of think of a more of almost a molecular level of what is giving these type of effects, what's the difference in work and heat type of uh, parameters. So when we look at um, the internal energy or the energy of a system, we often will want to reframe the energy into variables that are more natural for the case in which we're working. And in this case, this is what leads to different types of energy besides the internal energy that we talk about in biological thermodynamics. One of the most common is enthalpy. And we use a capital H um, to represent the enthalpy of a system. And like it's an energy, just like uh, uh, the internal energy is, but it has different properties where it's dependent on different variables and has a practical sense for being able to be used, therefore, under different conditions. And this is vague, let's be a little more specific. Specifically, the enthalpy of a system, or that type of energy, is basically directly proportional to the heat. So the heat absorbed or transmitted you know, in a system at constant pressure. And so this will give us, this type of energy is directly related to the heat of a system when you're under constant pressure conditions. So what do we mean by dependent variables? Well, you can see that the internal energy is dependent on the entropy. Its dependent variables are entropy, volume, and number of moles. So in biological systems, often volume is a very hard variable to fix, et cetera. It, often it's pressure that we can say constant in a system. So when we're not wanting to look at um, mechanical work type systems and we want to be able to get an intuition for how the energy is directly to just the heat component, we use enthalpy. Now we define enthalpy. So def enthalpy is defined to be U plus PV. But as I said earlier, we always look at the change in energy. So we're gonna look at the change in this type of energy as well. So it'll be the change in enthalpy that we're interested in looking at, which goes as the change in internal energy plus the change in the product PV. So expanding this out, you can see that it's the change in internal energy plus PDV plus VDP or expanding this out, right? So now uh, we can tell that if we're, um, you know, this right here, for a closed system where you don't have any change in the number of moles, you know, is U plus PV is TS. 
right? So this is, or basically heat, but I'm gonna put it, so this is the change in the heat of the system. Also, we just said that we want this under constant, so if we make this under constant pressure conditions, then this goes to zero, and so the change in enthalpy goes as just how the heat changes in the system. More specifically, as we'll talk about further in this course, uh, most, a lot of thermodynamics is trying to get an intuition and a feel for entropy. And you can see that it's really the enthalpy goes as the entropy changes and it's scaled by the temperature in this system. So, as we've defined enthalpy here, and we're gonna show this later, but when we look at the mathematics of thermodynamics, through the property of exact differentiation, we can use what's known as a Legendre transform to kind of show the fundamental equation for enthalpy. And as since what it has the property of is changing this mechanical work from its dependent variable in internal energy being volume to its dependent variable being pressure. So now in a closed system where you don't have any change in the number of moles under isobaric conditions or constant pressure, then the change in the energy, which we call enthalpy, is just the change in the heat, which we will see through the second law is TDS for a reversible system. So that's how we come about this. And a lot of what we do in biology, most biological reactions end up being under constant pressure condition. So this allows us to see where the heat or where this type of energy that we call heat is going when you're doing different types of processes. And so we even say as a terminology that if delta H is negative, that it's exothermic, that it releases heat uh, into its surrounding. Or if it's delta uh, uh, H or the change in enthalpy is positive, that it's endothermic, that it requires heat into the system for that type of process uh, to happen, et cetera. So this ends up being very useful, one of the very useful types of energy because of its direct relation to being just the energy of heat under constant pressure conditions for biological systems. As we've seen, heat is, um, uh, you know, can be broken up into conjugate field of temperature and entropy. And a lot, as we, thermodynamics, as the name implies, is, this, is oftentimes, you know, focused on the study of heat. And the study of heat really involves this idea of entropy. And we're going to spend most of our time in thermodynamics trying to get a better intuition for this variable. One of the key insights came when uh, Boltzmann was able to equate this concept of heat or entropy to the change in the number of configurations in the system, a probabilistic, how many probabilistic ways microstates exist in a system. This is one of our key insights to get from the macroscopic of thermodynamics to the microscopic world. Um, a molecular level world is through looking at this. And we look at the statistics or probability of different things happening for all these, you know, millions, Avogadro's number of microstates, particles, et cetera, in a system. And it gives us a sense and, and helps us understand how, you know, uh, we think of entropy from a microscopic standpoint. One of the first things we often learn when we look at entropy, we learned in some of our introductory physics and chemistry classes, is it has a lot to do with the amount of order and or disorder in a system. And this is a very useful kind of practical analogy to how entropy can behave, that you know, when you mix something like you have you know, some molecules, say sucrose, sugar, in a water system, and then you uh, have pure water where you put on top of it, we know that the, those molecules distribute themselves. They increase their number of microstates to occupy as many potential different configurations as possible. And you never see the opposite. Once it forms this, you never see it kind of 
go back in this direction to a lower entropy state. So we often think of things thermodynamically as one of the axioms of thermodynamics is this idea that entropy tends to maximize or the amount of disorder tends to. But keep in mind this is also always scaled by temperature. And it's at really high temperatures where this really uh, takes hold the most. So, you know, we can now start talking about what are low entropy and high entropy states in biological systems by, you know, how ordered or disordered they are, how many available microstates uh, there are in a system. There are more ways to take the water molecules and to configure them when you have something like water, even more if you uh, do something like steam or vaporize it, than if you confine those molecules to lattice positions in a solid crystal like ice is, which will have a much lower entropy state, et cetera. Same when you take something like diamond and you're able to vaporize that carbon, you give it a lot more configurations for those carbon atoms to explore and hence a higher entropy, et cetera. And so it has a lot to do with the number of ways you can configure um, microstates. So it has a lot to do with probability and statistics of looking at um, of degenerate microstates uh, in a system. And it gives us a, a really a peer into the microscopic for biological thermodynamics. And we have, you know, it, it helps us explain from a fundamental theory standpoint some things that we're very familiar with uh, and seem very uh, intuitive by nature if we take you know, a separate container that has some oxygen gas, uh, you know, one that has some hydrogen gas, we put them, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen gas, and we put them in, um, you know, next to each other with a barrier, and then we release that barrier, you know, these gases mix, right? And this is increasing the entropy of the system. Uh, and you don't see, and this happens spontaneously, you don't see spontaneously you know, the other process happened, taking a mixed gas like this and seeing it spontaneously separate into these two. The opposite, you often do work or do something to make this type of process happen. So there's a natural that, you know, it's entropy gives a directionality to spontaneity or to the time or, or to time's arrow itself, to the flow of processes in a system. Now you can further think about this system more. You have oxygen and uh, you know hydrogen in a container, and right, we know that oxygen and hydrogen can react to form water vapor. Um, now, is this increasing, you know, its entropy in the system? No, this has a higher entropy here than this. This is actually has fewer, right? You you've now taken. Uh, you've made it in fewer configurations. You've taken two diatomics and made a triatomic molecule into it. And so to, for this to, to happen, you know, we say that, how do we explain this as far as entropy increasing? Well, entropy does increase in this process, just not if we just look at the system. The system's entropy actually decreases. But the total entropy, which is the entropy of both the surroundings, the entire universe, and the system uh, itself, that does increase in any process that does happen. So uh, we have to, this is often one of the big confusing points is, is focusing what really thermodynamics says is the entropy of the universe or the entropy of both the system and the surroundings increases. Um, in any spontaneous or process that happens. It doesn't, we oftentimes, as uh, biochemists, we're looking at just the system, and that can either increase or decrease um, depending on, you know, overall energy, which this can play just one role in. So, now we've kind of looked more at the heat. We've even seen that we often define new ways of looking at energy so that they're equated to just this heat type of energy, like enthalpy is most commonly used when we want it to, to, there, to basically eliminate all other work terms and just make the energy equal to the amount of heat in a system. 
by doing things at constant pressure in closed systems, etc. So there's another energy, in fact there's several, but probably the, the next most commonly used in biological thermodynamics is the idea of free energy, how much extra energy we have for different, uh, to do different processes. And this was first developed by Gibbs, and so we often call it the Gibbs free energy. Um, and this is, in a sense, an extra, it, it's an energy term itself, and it, it has the enthalpy component in it, in a sense. So it has the enthalpy component, and it also takes into account the heat component. So it's the Gibbs energy is defined as U plus PV minus TS. And as we showed, so, so you can say that it's also defined as H because H is U plus PV, the product of PV. So it's in a sense H minus TS. Um, and what this has the property of doing is like we said before with the, um, uh, the enthalpy of a system, uh, we can do a Legendre transform on this because of its property that it's a state function and exact differential. And we're gonna show this again more in a mathematic uh, video separate from this. But as we showed before, H has the property of flipping the dependent and independent variables and it flips the sign. And you know this one does the same. So while U, the internal energy, is dependent on entropy, volume, and number of moles, enthalpy is flips this one and it's entropy pressure, the number of moles. Well now you can see the Gibbs free energy is temperature, pressure, and number of moles. So, and this is very commonly used in chemistry, biochemistry, and biological processes because to look at any type of reaction or the chemical work term, the fundamentally the easiest thing practically for us to hold constant is the pressure and the temperature. It's not easy to think of ways that you could hold the entropy and volume constant to look at how the chemical work uh, uniquely affects a, an energy. But it is much easier to do things under isothermal conditions and isobaric conditions. In fact, that's what we often think of doing in most biological systems. They're done at more or less the same temperature and at atmospheric pressure for the most part. And then we can look at how, um, you know, the energy just depends on a chemical work term, etc. The other thing that's probably most critical about this, we use these concepts so much, this idea of free energy, this idea of enthalpy, which is we often equate to the heat in the system, you know, under certain conditions and you know, this concept of entropy, temperature entropy and its relation to heat, that probably the most fundamental thermodynamic formula you use in biological thermodynamics is a consequence of looking at the change in this, um, you know, function right here, which we've written here, and, you know, under constant temperature conditions um, for this equation. So, Isothermal conditions, this is probably one of the most fundamental equations we use. And we often look at the change in the energy by looking at it as an enthalpy term and an entropy term. Or looking at its enthalpy as a type of energy and its TDS heat enthalpy or entropy term as another type of energy. And looking at those two to help explain how the overall uh, energy changes and whether something will likely happen or not or whether it's we call it spontaneous or not spontaneous type of process. And so we often think of these as as you know because we so commonly look at this as, as enthalpy you know trying to find its way you know into you know decreasing or find its way into a minimum well and entropy being the one as you increase temperature that that helps maximize or, or helps it you know get out of these type of processes this is kind of a way that often in a very um, uh, simplistic view gets used to to try to help us uh, uh, come to grips with some of these concepts and but it, it's very clear that when we want to know whether 
we think a biological process will happen. For it to be spontaneous, it, it needs to, its change in free energy needs to be negative. Um, so it needs to decrease overall um, during the process. So we often look at that as, as how does the enthalpy and its entropy change. And you can see, uh, I've given a, a couple scenarios here. We often will say when things are, for example, um, you know, entropically driven because it's really the entropy term that's driving um, the Gibbs free energy negative more than it is per se an, an enthalpy term. And it's things like this that we often equate to biology itself. While at very high temperature, entropy dominates everything, as you decrease temperature and get to physiological conditions, conditions that our weather supply here on Earth, which is significant, is um, significant, uh, you know, substantially low enough so that you can often have enthalpy help dominate this and allow bigger structures to form that aren't entropically favored, they're enthalpically favored. So from a microscopic or a molecular standpoint, we often think of these enthalpies as giving us some insight into what's changing about the bonding and interaction of the molecules, the biological molecules of interest. While the entropy telling us more about the arrangement of some of those molecules, their order or disorder uh, in the system, et cetera. And I like to uh, end with an example or so, which we'll be giving a lot of biological examples where we work things explicitly, but where we look at things in just kind of general terms. So when we look at this, for example, a common process of a protein where a ligand might bind to it, we want to use thermodynamics to understand does it bind, does it not under certain conditions, et cetera. And again, we often think about this as how does it change the, um, the energy of the system? When we think of enthalpy you know, of this system as you know, something that is going to change the bonding structure, you know, how that ligand bonds or interacts with um, the protein, uh, while things like the entropy is how much it, it limits its configurational, it probably had a lot more flexibility when it's unbound and now you're going to limit it by binding it in a pocket. You might also change, you know, the ordering of the solvent around a system that might give it more order around a, a system or something that causes more disorder in a system. So we often think of pros biological processes in terms of its enthalpic and entropic effects and, and how those come together uh, to either make things enthalpy driven, entropy driven, or sometimes you know, equally weighted in this ca uh, case. Uh, to help us figure out if something like a protein plus its ligand are going to form a protein ligand complex. Um, and, you know, it's its Gibbs free energy that helps define its equilibrium of this, how much of these uh, you're going to form. So a lot of things binding in biology, you know, is dictated by the Gibbs free energy, its equilibrium uh, concentrations in this. And we often thermodynamically bring it back down to the entropic and enthalpic effects that go into these effects happening or not at various temperatures and pressures of interest. Finally, you know, when we, so we've now looked at several different types of energy, the internal energy, you know, uh, the, um, the enthalpy of a system, you know, T, you know, ds, basically the heat or the entropy of a system and the Gibbs free energy, all energy terms here. And their dependence on different variables, for example, what we said here that this is dependent on entropy, volume, and the number of moles. One of the things that's really quite astonishing about equilibrium thermodynamics is that the energy is dependent on such a few number of variables. Basically one for every, one for the heat term and one for every work term that is applicable to a problem. So it's oftentimes something like this where it's just three macroscopic variables that more or less define all of thermodynamics or define all of the thermodynamic quantities uh, and all the macroscopic uh, 
uh, behavior in a system like this. And this is one of the powers of thermodynamics. It also translates both computationally and experimentally because oftentimes a single calorimetric, calorimetric or uh, computational experiment can done that also that provides these um, macroscopic variables, measurables of them, and therefore by defining such a few variables, now you can calculate all other thermodynamic quantities in a system. So oftentimes a single calorimetric experiment can be used for a specific temperature and pressure to define the biological thermodynamics of a system. So I hope that gave you a good introduction to biological thermodynamics. We're going to continue in this lecture series uh, with future videos on the mathematics of thermodynamics, uh, an introduction to calorimetry, to computational thermodynamics, and we're really going to delve into a lot of specific biological examples, use cases of using energy, entropy, temperature, thermodynamic properties to really give us insight about biological systems uh, and understand biological thermodynamics better. All of this can be found at uh, biopchem.education website. Thank you.